Hello again, John McGrady here, and welcome back to our interview with a famous statistician series. And today, it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Patrick Hagerty, who is actually Distinguished Professor and Associate Chair at the University of Washington Department of Biostatistics. He's also the Director for Biomedical Research at the School of Medicine and School of Public Health. And he actually has a Hopkins connection. He did his PhD here back in the 90s and worked closely with Scott Zeger, who we've interviewed, uh, doing some work on dealing with correlated categorical outcomes in a longitudinal data framework. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today, Pat. Thanks, John. It's my pleasure. Excellent. So, uh, so as you, we've just established, you've been active in the field for a long time now, and you're now associate chair of the department at Washington, have a role in educating future statisticians and mm -hmm. such, and have worked with people closely uh, over the past years. Uh, can you talk about some uh, advances in public health that have come through the use of statistics recently? Sure. Sure, John. So, so my interest, as you said, working with Scott Seeger was an awesome opportunity. I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And my research is really I interested in studying factors that change over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, an area that's continued to grow. The relevance in medicine and public health has been to look at the statistical methods to study treatments that may change over time. It's complicated. People have to look at what drives that treatment change. People have to decide when you study a changing treatment, what do you actually want to study as the treatment? Mm. So I think that's been an enormous area led by a number of scholars out there, really anchored in, in um, foundational concepts of causal inference to clarify a lot of those complications that arise when you look at data uh, changing over time. That kind of data um, has also led to thinking about designs, uh, clinical designs, how should we treat patients? How should we change our treatment of patients? So how should we design trials? How should we, yeah. how, how to, should look, we to look at such things, I yep. guess, right? Mm -hmm. How do we structure a trial where as part of the trial there is a change, mm -hmm. uh, a decision point where you could be treated one way or another? Um, another part is to think about guidelines for managing patients. Um, a great example is in um, anemia treatment where um, blood iron is measured on the basis of that blood iron, a certain dose of treatment will be given to move that blood iron up if it needs to go up or down if it needs to go down. And then how do you study the consequences of treatment schemes that um, modify um, what's delivered over time? So you have to consider lags and, yeah. and that sort of thing and yep. let the amount of drug already in the system or treatment in the system when you're doing this is the pharmacokinetics. Lags as well as feedback, mm -hmm. right? The, right. The, the drug has an effect, but the effect may also impact the drug. So I would say in the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of careful, deep thinking put into that arena, which is really relevant for translating um, the the opportunities to make guesses about how to treat people into practice or to evaluate what are current practice patterns and whether they might be changed to get better outcomes. Excellent. So it's really making an impact on the field Absolutely. of clinical trials, et cetera. Yep. Great. So so now thinking prospectively, I mean, of course, this is work that goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see uh, in, in this realm and other realms of statistics are some of the challenges and or we might say opportunities yeah. uh, for researchers in the field moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, both challenges and opportunities that, that we start to work in um, is the availability of a very good and detailed clinical um, information system. So we're entering an era where um, we start to gather um, detailed longitudinal information about treatments and some outcomes on enormous numbers of patients. So I think there's really a lot of challenges in, in terms of figuring out what can we learn from that kind of data um, and how do we best approach um, such large-scale data um, large-scale observational data to decide what it is we can conclude and, and what may, may we not be able to conclude from that sort of data. So it's not just about the amount of data, but it's about smart approaches to actually it's, analyzing it. It's about smart approaches and knowledgeable approaches. Mm -hmm. Why does the data change? Um, again, back to the earlier comment on why are some patients treated one way and other patients treated another way? If you want to make comparisons about treatments, you have to address that um, head on. Part of it will be us quantitative scientists learning more about that culture of um, how is medicine delivered, how is information recorded and captured um, in some of these large scale systems. 
we'll also have the opportunity again as quantitative scientists to, to monitor data at that scale and then to learn are there serious concerns that we now see and we should throw up a flag and say let's look more closely at this treatment and this outcome maybe there's some safety concerns hmm. okay. so again surveillance opportunities on the clinical side um, I think will also grow so from from my role kind of interfacing with medicine in Washington I see a lot of the kind of clinical um, or, or medical side um, innovations and opportunities. Excellent. Well, so clearly this longitudinal data is, is, is sort of the way <laughs> of the future given the way we can collect things now and given yeah. the extra and more, you know, causal information we can get out of it as opposed to cross-sectional or single right. time point. And certainly longitudinal data involves a lot of studies, cohort and uh, those that fall under the realm of time to event or survival. And yeah. I know you've been working in that area right. as of late. So could right. you just tell us a little bit about the, the research that you're doing now? Sure. Yeah, sure. So about <clears throat> about 12 years ago, um, I encountered a question about whether one pathology measure was a better predictor of mortality in breast cancer women than a different pathology measure. And at the time, I wasn't really clear on how to address that. How do you compare two different predictors when the outcome of interest is in event time? Event times typically are censored. Mm -hmm. So event times have this feature where they're a mixture of a dead, alive, a status, as well as a time until, a quantitative measure of how long until someone dies. So that, that specific problem pushed me to think about developing classification error rates like mm. sensitivity and specificity for binary outcomes like dead or alive, but then recognizing that for clinical endpoints like the time until death, that dead or alive changes over time. So starting around 2000, uh, a line of research for me has been investigating the development of measures that talk about classification error rates, but acknowledging that the disease state is a disease state that changes over time. Um, in fact, I'll talk about that today here uh, oh, is it in your presentation, your yeah. seminar today. Yeah, excellent. I'm looking forward to that. So, I mean, that's very interesting. So, again, you get into this feedback system, right, to some degree? I mean... I think the key thing in, in, um, in the typical concepts of sensitivity and specificity is there's diseased and not diseased. Right. And then there's a marker value that's measured. Um, as soon as you say there's a time component, what happens typically for event times is you're, you're a control. You don't have disease. And then eventually you switch roles and now you become a case. You're a person who does have disease. So I don't think too much about the feedback. I guess on feedback, you're right. But I think more about... transition, though? Yeah, how do you want to define a case? You mm -hmm. know, it's basic epi principles um, come to bear. Do you want to talk about a prevalent case two years from now? All the cases that have accrued? Or again, today I'll talk more about the idea of bringing time into it. Let's talk about an incident case mm -hmm. at two years among people who haven't yet had the event here's my new case who are my controls people that are still disease free at two years so it brings really a dynamic mm -hmm. component mm -hmm. to the concept of sensitivity and specificity got it so it's time specific or temporally adjusted or something yeah. of that nature yeah so very... you can see i like problems with time <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> well that's a, it's a yeah. forward it's always forward it's thinking always right it's always forward. perspective yeah so that's yep. a good way to look at it so as you know, being at UW and the School of Public Health and here at Hopkins, we, we are privileged as educators to be able to teach a lot of people, yeah. even though uh, uh, many of those who are not pursuing biostatistics as their main field, but are going to have a you know, a neat role in public health. And uh, so we, we have these large introductory courses where we cover a fair amount yeah. in a short period of time, but it maybe is sometimes thought of only tip of the iceberg as right. in terms of what is done in statistical methodology. And uh, I'm tr always trying to make the case with my students that, you know, that what you get in the basics will carry you very far forward. A lot of what we do in more advanced statistics really takes those and right. uh, maybe improves upon them for a specific situation yep. or tweaks them. So yep. can, how important to, as a statistician and an educator, mm -hmm. um, do you think the basics of statistics are exploratory data analysis, you know, sampling variability yeah. and inference, regression yeah. techniques, <clears throat> that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say, say, say two things that um, as professional um, practitioners, that foundational material is so crucial. You know, we, we often see that a, a two-sample comparison of a certain outcome 
essentially a t-test can can get you quite far mm -hmm. in in diving into the scientific detail maybe you need to subset on certain groups and and often that's driven by the scientific question mm -hmm. to dictate how should you approach it and look at the data so i think the the fundamental material is crucial i think over and over again we get reminded even as i said earlier about this clinical electronic medical record system what is the sampling that led to these data? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. is this a, a representative or, or non-representative sample? Again, a fundamental idea of probability concepts being used here to go from a sample to some generalizable population. So I think the, the, um, the core concepts permeate everything we do in practice. I think the core concepts also find their way in our own research. Today I'll, I'll again talk about bringing time into classification accuracy. The real goal for my talk today is, is to really encourage people to make a very simple scatter plot, a certain measure as a function of time, and then to draw a smooth curve hmm, through that okay. scatter plot as capturing what is the the essence of what is changing over so time. So some sort of regression over time, right? Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. In this one, it's basically a smoothing over time, but a, a form of regression Well, it's sort time. of a very flexible form of regression, yeah. right? Yeah. So. so even after kind of thinking about how to bring time into this problem, you know, what I come back and deliver is a representation of systematic change um, as a function of time. Excellent. Well, uh, Patrick's been on the go today. You know, he hit the ground running as soon as he got to Baltimore and we'll be in meetings until he gives this talk that we're mm -hmm. looking forward to. So I really want to thank you for taking My time pleasure, to actually Sean. come and talk to the thank students you. and the audience. And uh, I look forward to your talk. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Sean. All right. Cheers. Cheers.